What is the OSI model? As a young leader, you need to understand the OSI model. Why? Because it will help you guide your IT or network directors, managers, and IT teams. Understanding the OSI model will also help you when your network leadership comes to you for help. Knowing how each layer interacts with each other will help paint a picture of how to best troubleshoot a network issue. The OSI model also helps you understand the type of equipment that you need to have in your network. Do you need a layer 2 switch or a layer 3 switch? A CAT6 or CAT5 Ethernet cable? But before we get started, a word from our sponsor. AITS Corp helps protect your sensitive and irreplaceable data with enterprise cloud backups with ransomware protection. The HIPAA compliant backups help you be prepared in the event of a cyber attack like ransomware, hardware failure, or other disasters like water or humidity damage. Write to info at AITScorp.us or call 240-396-2111 today to schedule a free consultation. AITS Corp, protecting your data from the unexpected. Now let's get back to it. The Open Systems Interconnection, or OSI model, describes seven layers that computer systems use to communicate over a network. It was the first standard model for network communications, adopted by all major computer and telecommunication companies in the early 1980s. The modern internet is not based on OSI, but on a simpler TCP slash IP model. However, the OSI seven layer model is still widely used as it helps visualize and communicate how networks operate and help isolate and troubleshoot networking problems. OSI was introduced in 1983 by a representatives of the major computer and telecom companies and was adopted by ISO as an international standard in 1984. So now let's, let's take a look at the OSI model explained. The OSI com is comprised of seven layers. And from the top down, we're going to start with the layer seven, which is at the application layer. Then after the application layer, we have the layer six, which is the presentation layer, layer five, which is session layer, layer four, which is transport layer, layer three, which is network layer, layer two, which is the data link layer, and layer one, which is the physical layer. Now what we'll do over the next few minutes is we're going to expand a little bit more and learn a little bit more about these layers, how they interact with each other, as well as some troubleshooting tips um, and, and tools that you can use to troubleshoot in some of these respective layers. We, we will take it from the top down, from the application layer that directly serves the end user all the way down to the physical layer. Layer number seven, which is the application layer. The application layer is used by end user software such as web browsers and email clients. It provides protocols that allow software to send and receive information and present meaningful data to users. A few examples of application layer protocols are the Hypertext Protocol or HTTP as you might be more familiar with, the File Transfer Protocol or FTP, Post Office Protocol or POP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol or SMTP, and Domain Name System or DNS. This is the only layer that directly interacts with the data from the users. So for applications like web browsers and email clients rely on the application layer to initiate communication. But you have to keep in mind that the client software applications are not part of the application layer. Rather, the application layer is responsible for the protocols and data manipulation that the software relies on to present meaningful data to the user. Now let's go on to layer six, the presentation layer. The presentation layer prepares data for the application layer. It defines how two devices should encode, encrypt, and compress data so it is received correctly on the other side. 
The presentation layer takes any data transmitted by the application layer and prepares it for transmission over the session layer. This is the only layer that directly interacts with data from the user. Software applications like web browser and email clients rely on the application layer to initiate communication. Layer 5 or session layer. The session layer controls the conversation between different computers. The session layer or layer 5 creates communication channels called sessions between devices. It is responsible for opening sessions, ensuring that they remain open and functional while data is being transferred and closing them when communication ends. The session layer can also set checkpoints during data transfer. If the session is interrupted, devices can resume data transfers from the last checkpoint. The session layer also synchronizes transfers with checkpoints. So for example, if you have a 400 megabyte file that is being transferred, it is the session layer that sets a checkpoint every 10 megabytes, for example. In that case, uh, if something happens, if you lose connectivity or there's a disconnect for whatever reason, um, after 350 megabytes have been transferred, the session could be resumed from the last checkpoint meaning that only 50 megabytes uh, of data need to be transferred. Without the checkpoints, the entire transfer would have to begin from scratch. The transport layer takes data transferred in the session layer, or layer five, and breaks it into segments on the transmitting end. It is responsible for reassembling the segments on the receiving end turning it back into data that can be used by the session layer. The transport layer carries out flow control, sending data at a rate that matches the connection speed of the receiving device. An error control, checking if the data was received correctly, and if not, requesting it again. The transport layer, or layer four, provides reliable data transmissions to the upper layers end-to-end -end communications, flow control, multiplexing, error detection, and correction, and virtual circuit management are typical transport layer functions. Now let's talk a little bit about TCP and UDP functions at the transport layer. Although error correction is a function in the transport layer, UDP does not perform any error detection or correction. Instead, it relies on higher level protocols to do this. Now let's talk a little bit about some problems that could occur in layer four and what could be some possible solutions. Since TCP and UDP use ports for communications, most layer four problems resolved around ports being blocked. When troubleshooting layer four communications issues, first make sure that there are no access lists or firewalls blocking TCP UDP ports. QoS or quality of service can also affect the transport layer. QoS or quality of service can block or slow traffic and also cause fragmentation of large frames. As such, if QoS is enabled in your network, try disabling it while troubleshooting a layer four issue. Now let's move on to layer three. Layer three is the network layer. The network layer has two main functions. One is breaking up segments into network packets and reassembling the packets on the other end. The other is routing packets by discovering the best path across a physical network. The network layer uses network addresses, typically internet protocol addresses, to route packets to a destination node. The network layer, or layer three, defines how to transport traffic between devices that are not logically attached. This layer also supports connection-oriented and connection-less service from higher level protocols, addressing error handling, congestion control, and packet sequences are performed at this layer. Routers and layer three switches operate at the network layer. IP, IPX, and AppleTalk are examples of network layer implementations. 
Now let's talk a little bit about what could be some problems that could happen at layer three and what could be some of the tools that could be used to, to solve these problems. So problems that occur at this layer are network addressing issues and routing issues. Since network addressing is usually handled by a network administrator, it is important to ensure that the device has the proper network addressing assigned to it. Ping is a great troubleshooting command to use to help troubleshoot layer three issues. For example, a successful ping to the loopback address 127.0.0.1 will let you know that IP is working properly. A successful ping to the device assign address will show that the device has the proper IP configured. A successful ping to the device default gateway will show that the device is communicating on the network properly. And a successful ping past the default gateway will show you that the internet networking is working properly. So you can ping Yahoo or Google or any other uh, commercial website. Uh, and if, if, that, if that ping uh, succeeds, then that means that uh, there's good internet communication. If routing is not working, the trace command will show where the packets are being dropped. Why? Because when you run the trace command on a, on a computer system, it gives you each hop, right? You can see where your, your uh, trace command goes from your computer, right, to your gateway, to perhaps a distribution switch, and then from the distribution switch, perhaps to the core switch, and then from the core switch, um, you know, ultimately perhaps to, to, to a website, right? Um, if, if that's where you're tracing your command to. So if there was an issue, for example, um, you know, at a distribution switch or a core switch, then you would see your trace command drop, right? So instead of being successful, um, at, it's, let's, let's say that there's an issue at your distribution switch. When you run the trace command, then everything will be successful up to the point where your packet is going through uh, the distribution switch. At that point, then you will see a failure and then you would know that there's, there's definitely an issue with that device. Also, the show IP route command will show you if the device has the proper routing tables. If the device cannot communicate on its local network, the show IP protocols command will show if the device has the proper layer three protocols enabled. Now let's move on to layer two. The data link layer or layer two establishes and terminates a connection between two physically connected nodes on the same network. At the data link layer, layer two, directly connected nodes are used to perform node to node data transfers where data is packed into frames. The data link layer also corrects errors that may have occurred at the physical layer. The data link layer creates frames from bits of data and provides error correction. It consists of two sublayers. The first sublayer is the logical link control or LLC layer, and the second sublayer is the media access control or MAC layer. These two sublayers provide physical media independence. Let's talk a little bit about the first sublayer. The LLC sublayer 802.2 is responsible for identifying different network layer protocols and then encapsulating them to be transferred across the network. This layer communicates with the network layer. The MAC sublayer specifies how data is placed and transported over the physical wire. It controls access to the physical medium, physical addressing, network topologies, error notification, and delivery of frames are defined at the MAC sublayer. Now let's, let's uh, talk a little bit about a problem at this layer and some potential solutions. Problems that occur at this layer include MAC addressing errors, duplex errors, collisions, CRC frame errors, and spanning tree problems. Ways to detect if layer two errors are occurring include using various show commands. These include show interface, right? Show port, 
show spanning tree commands, and so forth. FCC errors, single, multiple, and late collisions, runs, runs and giants and broadcast storms are all ways to tell that there are layer two issues. And finally, we have arrived to the very last layer, the very first layer, which is the physical layer. The physical layer defines the physical medium. It defines the media, the connector type, the signaling type, baseband versus broadband, for example. This includes voltage levels, physical data rates, and maximum cable lengths. The physical layer is responsible for converting frames into electronic bits of data, which are then sent or received across the physical medium. We're talking about twisted pair, coaxial, and fiber optic cables, as well as interface types uh, operate at this level. Other implementations at this layer are repeaters and hubs, for example. Since the physical layer is responsible for the media type and connector type, if this layer is not functioning properly, all higher layers will not work. Problems at this layer typically occur with cabling and media connector issues. For example, if the network cabling is longer than the supported length or broken, then the communication will not work. And I've seen this uh, time and time again. You know, we, you know, there, there's uh, networks that I've uh, helped fix that have cable runs that go beyond the required length. And what happens is, you know, if if you're doing that, certain services will not perform as desired. Um, some data will not flow, right? Sometimes uh, there are issues with that connectors. If you look, for example, uh, at an Ethernet cable. Uh, that's not working. Uh, in some cases, you might find that the RJ45 connector, it's either broken or perhaps one of the, the, the pairs have come uh, ha have become undone. And so again, that, that cable has to either be replaced or re-terminated for those organizations that um, um, create uh, their own cable. So troubleshooting errors at this layer or at this level include uh, using cable testing tools to ensure cabling is functioning properly. Uh, link lights on network devices, for example, are also a great way to troubleshoot issues at layer one. If the link light is green, then the layer one is working. If the link light is, or if the link light has another color or not lighting up at all, for example, then there are problems at that layer that need to be fixed. Easy way to test this is by swapping out ethernet cables, for example. You take another cable and you test if, if the cable works, then you know that there was a layer one issue. Or swapping SFPs, for example, or modules, or uh, using cable testers, right? Uh, like I, I mentioned earlier. Now, I also want to briefly describe and, and paint a picture that helps understand how data flows through the OSI model. In order, you see, in order for human readable information to be transferred over a network from one device to another, the data must travel down the seven layers of the OSI model on the sending device, all the way from the top, layer seven, all the way to layer one, and then travel all the way up the seven layers from layer one all the way to layer seven on the receiving device. Let's take a look at, if, uh, let, let's go through an example. Let's say Mr. John wants to send Ms. Jane an email, right? Mr. John composes his message in an email application on his laptop and then hits that send button. His email application will pass his email message over the application layer, which will then pick a protocol, in this case, SMTP and pass the data along to the presentation layer. The presentation layer will then compress the data and then it will hit the session layer, which will initialize the communication session. The data will then hit the sender's transportation layer where it will be segmented. Then those segments will be broken up into packets at the network layer, which will be broken down even further into frames at the data link layer. The data link layer will then deliver those frames to the physical layer, which will then convert that data into bit streams of ones and zeros, and then send it through the physical medium, such as ethernet cable or fiber or wireless. 
once Mrs. Jane's computer receives the bitstream through the physical medium, could be, uh, let's say, Ethernet cable in this case, the data will flow through the same series of layers on her device, starting with layer one all the way to uh, layer seven. First, the physical layer will convert the bit streams of ones and zeros into frames that get passed to the data link layer. Then the data link layer will then reassemble the frames into packets for the network layer. The network layer will then make segments out of packets for the transport layer, which will then reassemble the segments into one piece of data. The data will then flow into the receiver's session layer, which will pass the data along to the presentation layer and then end the communication session. The presentation layer will then remove the compression and pass the raw data up to the application layer. The application layer will finally then feed the human readable data along to Ms. Jane's email software, which will allow her to read Mr. John's email on her laptop screen. Now, as a leader, why is it advantageous to understand the OSI model? You see, the OSI model helps users and operators of computer networks. It helps you determine, for example, the hardware and software that you need to build a network. Do you need a layer two switch or a layer three switch, for example? It helps understand and communicate the process followed by components communicating across your network. It helps you as a leader guide your team when performing uh, troubleshooting exercises by identifying which network layer is causing an issue and focusing your efforts and your team's efforts on that layer. Although the modern internet doesn't strictly follow the OSI model, the OSI model is still very useful, again, for troubleshooting network problems. Whether it's one person who can't get their laptop on the internet or a website going down for thousands of users, the OSI model can help the, you, the leader, to break down the problem and isolate the source of the problem. If the problem can be narrowed down to one specific layer of the model, for example, a lot of unnecessary work can be avoided. And as we have reviewed in this video, there are steps and tools that you can use at each layer to troubleshoot. As a leader, this is incredibly important. Why? Because as a leader, you might find yourself leading an organization with a network that expands 10, 50, 200 buildings, for example, and your IT director, network manager might come to you for some ideas. Understanding the OSI model will help frame the conversation with your team or teams and guide those teams in the right direction. Thank you for watching. If you found this video helpful, remember to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. I love to hear questions from young leaders on topics they would like to learn more about. If this is the case, let me know and I will include it in my list of topics. All the best in your leadership journey.